Hi, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the live webinar session. Thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule to join us today. Today, we will talk about combating cyber attacks, mitigating the human risk factors organized by CIO Academy Asia in close partnership with CrowdStrike. Before we start, let me share the agenda with you. Firstly, the opening remark by the CEO of CIO Academy Asia, Mr. P. Ramakrishna, or Rama, who is also the moderator, followed by 30 minutes of panel discussion, 20 minutes of Q&A, and we will end with the closing remark. So let me share with you a little bit about housekeeping. By default, you will all be muted during the presentations. If you have any questions throughout the live session, please feel free to post it within the question chat box and our moderator will take the questions and respond during the Q&A session. For any unanswered questions, the organizers will reach out to you. When a poll is launched, do interact and take part. We aim to make this insightful session interactive as well. At the end of the webinar, please do help us with a short survey and your feedback is much appreciated. To kickstart, let's welcome Rama, our moderator of this session, and over to you, Rama. Enjoy. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in to this live uh, webinar. Uh, I know we're going to take one hour of your time, so we'll have to do our best to make it worthwhile for all of you, okay? So uh, the topic for the discussion today is about combating cyber attacks, mitigating the human risk factor. Accompanying me today are four leaders from the industry. Let me introduce each and every one of them. Uh, the first person would be Mr. Paul Lake. He is the Director, IT Risk, risk Management and Security for the Japan and China APAC, MSD International. Uh, Paul, thank you very much for joining us. Next, we have Mr. Emil Tan, who is the co founder of Division Zero, a Singapore cybersecurity community group, and the co organizer and co founder of InfoSec in the City. Emil. Next, we have Mr. Paul Loke, who is the director technology and CIO for the Accountant General's Department in Singapore. Paul. And last but not least, we have Sharif El Nabawi, who is the Vice President, Sales Engineering, APJ CrowdStrike. Sharif, thank you very much, panelists. Okay, let's uh, kick off the session uh, with my opening remarks. Now, uh, you must be wondering why this particular title about the human risk factor. As I go along, you will understand why we have come about with this topic. Now, humans have always played a very integral part of digital transformation. And with the democratization of technology, more employees are accessing networks, using different kinds of devices, and they are digitally connected anywhere, anytime, on any device. Uh, more so with the current situation, with the crisis, where practically most people are working from home. Now, with this situation or this scenario, it has exponentially increased the attack surface, right? Um, organizations, realize that they are both more vulnerable now than ever before. During the pre-COVID, CIO Academy Asia did a survey on tech trends with some emphasis on cybersecurity. The survey was uh, launched uh, two months ago. Let me just highlight certain aspects of that survey which will be pertinent to the discussion today, okay? So the survey was all about transforming and upskilling to build resilience in organization. The first uh, part 
of the survey was about digital transformation. The second part, we narrowed down to questions about cybersecurity, right? And one of the questions that we asked were, what was your top cybersecurity challenges during digital transformation? The first response, the highest response we got was about insider threats and unknown threats. The second one was about lack of care or unawareness of employees. And the last, the, sec, the third part was about unauthorized access, right? So looking at the tree, you realize that even during the pre-COVID days, security is always a topmost concern for most organization. Now, let's move on to what's going to happen, what's happening today. The next slide, please. So now we are all hit by what is known as the black swan, right? The COVID-19 crisis has disrupted most of CIOs and CISOs plans. Uh, priorities are changing and everything that has been put in place previously are being rethought. So recently, during the crisis, we did another pulse poll just to ask how CIOs are adapting to the current situation. And with this poll, the question that was asked, can I have the next slide, please? Jessica? Yeah. Can you move on to the next slide? Yeah. OK. There's some difficulty. OK, yeah. Now, if only I can read the slide. OK, right. So we, we asked about the top three critical technology areas for the business continuity plans uh, amidst this current COVID situation. Topmost was network and connectivity. And I think this is uh, understandable because uh, everybody is adjusting to the current situation. You know, networks have to be set up. Uh, you know, connectivity problems and Wi-Fi issues at home. So this turned out to be number one, 66%. The second one was all about toolkits, okay, cybersecurity toolkits, right? Uh, we do hear a lot of uh, folks having issues with their VPNs, endpoint security, right? And the third was all about data management and security tools, right? So looking at this as a backdrop for the discussion today, you will probably realize that cybersecurity is certainly a very important aspect of the work that's being done during the crisis and how to be safe, right? So now let's move on to engage the panelists with this as the backdrop. I'll be asking Mr. Paul Lok. Uh, Paul, uh, tell us something about the work that you do at AGD. And I would like to hear your views about the survey response that we got where internal and unknown threats were cited as the number one challenge for cybersecurity. Over to you, Paul. Thanks, Rama. Um, so a little bit about AGD. We are relatively unknown uh, unless you are invoicing the government. And even then, you don't really see the AGD logo splashed all over the place. But we handle government financials and payroll, basically. Um, so with that function then comes a lot of the fiscal responsibility to make sure payments are made in a timely manner. Uh, and of course, very importantly, we are also always on the lookout for threats. Um, as you can imagine, Singapore government does spend a good amount across defense, across um, you know, infrastructure costs, um, everything else. So we have to make sure that all of those payments are secure. Right? We, what we don't want is money being transferred to the wrong bank account, for example. Um, as for the inside, in, as for the threats from the insider and the unknown threats, I think Rama, that's a very, very broad um, category. Insider threats definitely a risk. Um, I don't think any organization in the world can say that my staff are 100% honest. Right? Temptation always lurks. What we've seen in the past with in the world is always somebody who potentially hits a, a financial situation um, needs, and, and, and it's just temptation, right? Perhaps. Uh, a parent falling sick or a child falling sick and they just need money to um, deal with that situation. And then the, the temptation is just to do something so that I can get a quick buck and sort it out later. Um, gambling problems, other things may happen. So the insider threat is real. Um, data exfiltration is always real. Um, and why I say it's a very broad 
area because unknown threat, what is an unknown threat? Well, it's what we don't know what we don't know. Um, is a machine infected? Is somebody going through a hard situation? Um, for that matter, I think this morning, it was on the news wise this morning, I think Honda had one, had a, was hit by a ransomware. Um, there was a brewery in Australia that was hit by a ransomware. So these are all the threats that we have that are assessed. And the ransomware cartels are getting smarter. They are now coming out, they're going to, they're, they're collaborating with each other. Um, the ransomware bad actors are buying Office 365 uh, subscriptions and testing and saying, hey, does that exploit work? Is that an unknown threat to us? Well, that's possibly one of the things that we have to guard against. Right. So thanks, Paul. And you're, you're absolutely spot on when you said that, you know, it's, it's quite broad, especially in the context of what's happening today, because, uh, you know, we do hear about more incidents of phishing, ransomware, malware, right? Because, uh, you know, the situation is that people are more vulnerable now because of the fact that they're operating from home, right? Endpoint security also becomes a, a, a top uh, pro problem right now. So this is where I'm going to ask uh, Paul Lake. Paul Lake, the, the, the context of what you're doing in terms of uh, MSD and you're operating in so many markets, uh, what are your thoughts about uh, the, the, the responses on the survey? And also, uh, what is keeping you awake at night now during the crisis as far as security is concerned? Paul? Paul Lake? Uh, you're, 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 yeah, you're, <laughs> you're mute. Yeah. Hi, Rama, can you hear me? Yeah, now loud and clear. Go ahead. Yeah. Yes, uh, thank you for having me, right? Yes, uh, we, we, we are, uh, we as a global company uh, work as one IT, right? So we, we have one set of policy standards, operating procedures throughout. Our cyber team, uh, we operate based on the follow the sun model over the three region. Uh, on that basis, uh, let me just share a brief background of what MSD Singapore IT Hub is, where I'm based in. Right? Globally, we are, called, uh, we are known as Merck and Co. But outside the United States and Canada, we are known as MSD. Right? The IT Hub is part of a global network uh, with our sister hubs in New Jersey and Prague, uh, which is in Czech Republic. At MSD, our business is about really saving and improving life and IT Hub is operating in the intersections of the technology and healthcare and life science. In Singapore, we have more than 10 departments in IT uh, working together to use technology to develop life-saving solutions from data science to software engineering to cybersecurity to name a few. I led the cybersecurity team or IT risk management and security to name uh, that's what we call them in, uh, in MSD for the Ch Japan, China, and Asia Pacific market. Back to your questions on whether the, how, how we deal with that, you know, the solutions, uh, as much as I say, is I think it's a journey for us to get there for like most company, as much as we will try to automate uh, as much as possible to increase the efficiency and reduce human error, right? So the one, one of those common uh, sound is, common areas that we, we try to expedite or automate will be areas like the machine assisted kind of SOC support, automated kind of threat response, especially during this period of time when there is everyone is working remotely and endpoints is uh, one of those challenges. And of course, another way, another one is uh, rising is about adaptive risk management, right? Right. Okay. So uh, with that, maybe it's a good time for Emil. Emil, you have a lot of uh, interaction with the community of uh, computer security professionals, as well as you do have a lot of interaction with uh, startups, right? So uh, can you give us uh, your views about, uh, besides the fact that uh, insider threats uh, have been mentioned, uh, but I'd like to now maybe skew uh, the, the, the question more towards the area of automation and the fact that the topic is all about mitigating the human risk factor. Do you see a trend surfacing, you know, with your the ecosystem that you work with where people are looking at more uh, tools that requires less human intervention? Thank you, Rama. Uh... Right, I think the short answer definitely 
definitely um that is that is the trend that we are definitely seeing. Mm -hmm. Um, usually when we go about doing security, any of the advice that was uh you know we when we talk to any security companies as well as any startups, the first rule of thumb uh or the first question really is asked like is is um what what exactly is security to most company and how they are actually targeting uh this. Um, what 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 we have observed so far, uh, I would say all in all, the the the, the bosses, the Taukei's uh, mentality when they are dealing with security hasn't changed much, right? The first thing they want to do is right. I know I need to do security, but they they know they need to, but they just don't know how to. Uh, and usually they go to a lot of security providers and ask uh, to give give them that that one solution that I can just download. I can just put it aside and I know I have done this due diligence, right? I've done it. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the, tau the Tauke kind of uh, buying mentality hasn't changed much. Uh, but what we see uh, a, a big change is actually the, the security practitioners, the security professionals within a uh, more mature organization that has security team. Uh, the, the way they are looking at tools, the way they are shopping for tools uh, have changed uh, quite drastically the last five to 10 years. In the past, mm -hmm. they always go to new, they go to conferences, they go to the expo, they look at all the solution providers, uh, asking, you know, what are some of the new things you can tell me about my network that I don't know of? Uh, is there new proxies, new firewall, new IDSs, uh, new data that can, uh, I, can, I actually can get? But now uh, the mentality has changed to, they actually don't want to see that many data anymore. They actually are look, shopping for, for solutions that uh, are looking uh, that that can uh, empower data they already have, uh, and 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 allow them to 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 do security better and response better. Not just seeing more things. It's actually the end output, the the real uh, security uh, actionables uh, that that can mature and secure their organization. So uh, that is the the big shift that 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 we are seeing, and definitely. Uh, most organization, uh, most uh, organization that are doing security or have a security team, they realize it's very hard to uh, hire uh, uh, security practitioners now. There's a big lack of it, and what we see around is always left pocket to right pocket. You know, hiring from, from one co company A to B, and then practitioner from B will go to C, and C will go back to A. It's a big circle <laughs> of of, yeah. uh, of it's actually a big rotation. Um, so uh, definitely, then uh, there's there's a need then to to look at tools that can uh, augment um, uh, you know looking at human augmentation tools that can make them do uh, security better and response better for sure. So thanks, Samuel. I like I like the point you made about the human augmentation, and I think we'll come back to that. And maybe at this point, I'll I'll, I'll, uh, I'll direct my question to Sharif. Sharif. Uh, I, I I believe threat actors now are taking advantage, yeah, of the uh, COVID-19 uh, and they are infiltrating organizations. Uh, and I also uh, read that CrowdStrike has got this 2020 global threat report, you know, highlighting uh, real-world scenarios, right? And I think many of this was actually covered pre-COVID, but uh, now with your interaction with your clients, you're beginning to also uh, here, new threats and new uh, infiltrations that's happening. So, can you quickly uh, give us a, a view of uh, what's happening in the current situation? Absolutely. So, first of all, thank you for having me here, and pleasure to be a part of the panelist team. So, um, I think if you look at 2019 and what happened there, it does shape a base for us to see how COVID changed things in terms of increasing on certain aspects when it comes to certain type of attacks. So. 2019 focus was still on big game hunting in terms of ransomware. Uh, we've seen some ransomware um, cases where the ransom itself went up to 12.5 million. Uh, and it's not your regular uh, type of ransomware attack where spear fishing is more of a targeted attack where, you know, uh, specific individuals are targeted, improving the, the um, success rate. So that's number one. Secondly, we've seen a, a large um, also focus in terms of the um, when it comes to the financial institutions being targeted by e-crime. So there's a large number of e-crime groups that we've seen active in that. But I think majority, the, the main theme that we highlighted in the report and that is interesting and different than every year was the first time have we seen the number of attacks that are 
fileless attacks that do not use a malware or a particular binary to download on your system endpoint. We've seen an we've seen for the first year these types of attack, the fileless attack, being more than the malware, which means that now we're utilizing the attackers are more and more and the threat actors are more and more using what you have on your machine, PowerShell, uh, you know, any any normal normal language that would be used and any tools that are there, they will basically manage to get access to that and your traditional security solutions will not be able to use it because that's not a file, it doesn't, it's not covered by a, a signature, it's smallly towards the behavior. So that was definitely one of the themes pre-COVID. That increased heavily in COVID. In COVID, what we've seen literally from uh, March to April is a thousand plus increase in the number of files that have used the world or basically were used uh, as a COVID theme attacks by attackers. So you can imagine all the documents that you receive from attackers in spam phishing campaigns, whether they're saying, you know, WHO updates, COVID, recent uh, Ministry of Health COVID updates. Um, the attackers use that fear and they use the need that we have as humans to access more data and they use that against us. Uh, there's a higher possibility of myself or yourself or general public opening documents where it actually targets the pandemic, uh, which has increased. Uh, we've seen a number of groups and we track those like the wizard spider, mummy spider. They are all e-crime groups. We've seen them using those attacks in Japan, Italy, in many of the Asia countries uh, with the high success rate where they were able through those documents to install um, uh, binaries that will able to the first part of an attack that will, you know, whether it would lead to ransomware, exfiltration of data, et cetera. So, yeah, that's what we've seen. And uh, I think that theme will carry on. The increase in, in COVID themes, lured attacks that we're seeing are quite high at the moment. Okay. Sharif, you, 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 you touched on a very good point, which I'm going to ask uh, Paul Lick to, to uh, you know, uh, share his way in with his views. The point you made was that, uh, like for instance, you talk about phishing attacks, right? Social engineering. Uh, it's all about the humans, right? The humans can be a weak point, right? And you know, uh, without uh, regard to good cyber hygiene and callous attitude, it could be a most weakest link in this entire chain, right? So, uh, with this in mind. Uh, Paul Lake, uh, you did uh, share with me that uh, you are also increasingly looking at using artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, in terms of mitigating, you know, some of the uh, threats and uh, vulnerabilities that you find in your organization. Uh, could you just elaborate more on uh, some of those solutions where, you know, such solutions require less of uh, humans being involved? Yeah, sure. Uh, in fact, in fact, when we talk about cyber hygiene and disgruntled employees, uh, to back to Sheree's point, this is actually not a, a, a new issue, but it's definitely a challenging one. We have been handling this for throughout many, many years, right? So it is not just about people, but people, process, technology that needs to be involved. And to make it more challenging uh, in, a, in an organization or even globally in any, whether it's an SME or an MMC, um, there is a, is a moving target, like pre-COVID mm -hmm. pre and current situation, right? And, and, and especially with a human element that's inside there, right? So let me explain why I, call, I say that this is a moving target and then I come to a solution on that I'll propose, right? So when business and IT uh, has been accelerating digitally, right? And putting technology to make it easier to collaborate between business and IT. Unfortunately, security, like what uh, Sherry have mentioned, have not really kept up to that. Many times it is actually about, about uh, signature base, right? It's already outdated, right, to a, to a certain point. And traditional solutions actually really relies on prevention. And prevention is all about blocking, right? We, we lock, block things, we lock things down, we keep information silo. And whereas the rest of the organization is about sharing, right? And these two doesn't come together right so when and when we talk about human employees internal employees threat there are actually two types to think about it right so there are there are accidental threats 
that employees can uh, come up with and also disgruntled employees. Right? The extended one are people, are innocent people or innocent employees that are vulnerable for, for to subject to phishing, sending information, business information to their personal emails, the mobile phone, whereas the disgruntled employees are the ones that broke the trust that the company put on them. Right? So back, back to that, right? I, I, I say that there, there isn't a perfect solution. Right? Mm -hmm. It's really going back to the basic about people, process, and products. Right? And at the same time, you know, uh, human play a very significant role down here. And back to ML's point about uh, um, so-called like cyber security augmentation in terms of resource and, and, and stuff like that. I think, I think it is, it, human needs to work alongside with, with artificial intelligence or machine learning kind of stuff. Right. Earlier this year, actually, uh, we had the privilege from our data science team that has an opportunity to participate in the Singapore Model AI Governance Framework, which was presented during the World Economic Forums in Davos. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and our view is when we talk about AI, is about responsible AI. So let me let me let me bring that a little bit further. Right. Uh, among the framework, there are about responsible AI. There are uh, two guiding principles. Right. One, the, the AI decision making should be a process that is explainable, transparent, and fair. Right. And second, AI solution should be human centric. It has to be human centric. And there are three approaches to go into human centric or involvement in AI. And, and let me let me bring it down the next level. Right. In the framework, it actually talks about human in the loop human out of the loop and human over the loop. So there are three approaches. And the first one, human in the loop, it is very natural like what you've mentioned. Human is involved in every decision making. Mainly this category are, are things that concerns sensitive data, safety of human, right? In, in a nutshell, we bring back to technology. Right, it is like in in cyber, it will be mainly on the ICS, your crown jewel application data, the IOTs, uh, I mean the OT technology stuff. Whereby a switch, right, can cause harm even to human if the, the system goes bizarre, right. And in in general, in healthcare, it is like for example, you can use you can leverage AI in in interpreting images like the MRI images, right. A a, a diagnostic radiographer can only do let's say 30 interpretation of a, of an image per day. But if you use AI, you can do a lot, right? Mm -hmm. So, so sec, but you need a, a, a human to make a decision to give a medical advice. So that is human involvement. The second is human that does not need to be involved, right? That is well, the part whereby augmentation comes in, back to Edmund's point, right? That mm -hmm. is whereby you have large chunk of data, you need a standard profile of standard procedures, a playbook to run through it. So right. in cyber, right, it mainly basically ingestion of lots, threats, IOC and stuff like that. Lastly, right, which is when we say human uh, over the loop kind, whereby you can supervise, right? It, it, I think one of the best way to, to think about it uh, is like, for example, if you are look, you're navigating using a GPS, point mm -hmm. A, point B, Right. So you, you most of the time, the GPS will provide you with options, two options, three options to get there. But in between, the human intervention can come in to decide I want to go route B instead of route one. Similarly, it comes in lastly about uh, on cyber side is that whenever we make a decision in terms of of blocking or especially handling with third party risk, whereby a risk elements need to be tacked on to that human interventions can must comes in, even though you can use AI to collect this information. Thanks, thanks, Thank Paul. I think it's very good that you've broken it down into the three aspects, which is actually very much in line with uh, what we want to talk today about, you know, the whole human risk factor, right? So now with that in mind, uh, uh, Paul Lok, uh, how, how, how is your agency now uh, building your, your agility and uh, your resilience uh, with respect to some of the human factors uh, that was already talked about in terms of the cybersecurity uh, aspects of things, 
in, in your, your day to day work during the crisis? Well, I think uh, Paul talked about it a little bit. This whole uh, paradigm of automated um, detection, automated uh, uh, remediation. Um, there's a lot of machine learning and other AI things out there that can help. Um, behavioral analytics is one. So we see a lot of that happening today. Um, I think Sharif talked a little bit about file as mal malware, right? Okay, so mm -hmm. let's talk about the human. Okay, COVID-19, what has happened? One, the file malware has started to come up. Two, somebody's going to throw you and people are out of jobs, they're sending you resumes, right? That guy's getting smarter. Let's talk about uh, GAN, General uh, Adverse Neural Networks. What do you call it? GA, ah, well, it's the tip of my tongue. Anyway, uh, there's a website out there. This person does not exist. Right? Mm -hmm. It generates a computer generated photo that, it, that would pass on just to the naked eye. We all teach our staff, right? Please do not open an email from an unknown source. Yeah, all of us do that. Our HR recruitment team, what are they doing? Every day, opening these resumes, unknown source. It's not, you don't know if it's a real resume. That resume has a base 64 encoder command, it's six point PowerShell, beautiful. It's just got, it's gotten into the organization. So these are the sort of things that we start to look for. You know, it, it, is there, we look at points of data egress, we look at what's happening on the endpoint, and that helps us to then cut down the number of false positives I have, right? I am not worried about the virus that was picked up by the antivirus software. Yeah. I'm not worried about it because it, yeah, I know it's blocked. Yeah. What's the big deal, right? Yeah. I'm worried about the one they got through. What happened after that? And then yeah. from there, then you look at the entire ecosystem. So the layer defense, I think uh, security professionals, we've done this today, we talk about layer defense. Um, what about technologies like your seams? Do they have, ability to do some analytics correlation for you. Are they ingesting lots of data? What's, you know, um, there's always gonna be logs to review. There's always gonna be actions that you need to check. How do I make sure that the high risk ones are the ones that are targeted? So we so we try and make sure that we guard against the high risk ones. And yeah. perhaps if it's a, uh, well, yeah, you know, the um, fellas log in twice and keep the wrong password twice, I may not want to worry too much about it. But imagine if the if the same fellow is keying the, the password twice at the same time, every day and then coming back tomorrow and tomorrow and more then i start to think is is the fella trying to brute force because yeah i'm trying i'm trying twice so that the account doesn't get locked doesn't work i'll walk away it's a slow attack it comes in i can't detect it the machines are going to help us do things like that how do we do these um there are plenty of these that i think there's a lot of these things that we can do um right. and that's basically the approach that we've taken what are the high risk activities what are some of yep. the rules that we're going to set how do we manage mm -hmm. from there yeah, interesting, uh, Paul, uh, you mentioned the behavioral aspects, which actually is an area where, you know, uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning uh, is good at, right, in terms of detecting such anomalies, as well as, uh, and this is where I'm going to ask Sharif, right, with the sheer volume, right, of, uh, of threats and attacks that's happening, right, it, it's almost impossible, right, for humans to be so comprehensive in terms of uh, detecting and responding. So with respect to some of the solutions that you have with CrowdStrike uh, in the area of cloud, in the area of uh, threat hunting, uh, can you elaborate more on what is being done in this area with CrowdStrike solutions? Um, so first of all, uh, a lot of valid points have been mentioned here and I think tapping on each of them. Um, if I look back at you know, away from a, a solution and into the model of alert fatigueness, right? We all get tons of alerts. If the important ones with the highest risk, related to the highest risk assets are hidden and we're not able to um, have a high, you know, a, a, a human uh, be able to detect that because of the number of alerts, that, then everything has failed, right? So it's all back to the point of how can I reduce the number of alerts, only focus on the ones that matter, but that's a, that's the machine that's the machine side that's the tools and then me humans come in and they say okay here are the top 10 and then i can drill down and decide which ones are relevant reduce the risk remediate contain etc the ai helps massively in that in the three aspects that were mentioned by paul here because first of all i expect the tool to be able to use that and give me a reduced function a reduced number of alerts. secondly 
I need a second layer of humans, threat hunters specifically, whether from the customer incident response team or by partnership through the vendor to be able to detect that second layer. So, and, and their AI as well, that's beyond AI. So they use what's coming out of that and being able. And then at the end of the day, they will have to put a decision metrics, whereas the risk uh, aspects come in and I'll say, okay, based on this, then my risk level is X, I will apply that decision. And obviously that's all agreed in procedures up front. So the three layers are key here. If I now zoom in on a, a CrowdStrike or other vendors in that in, in that space, I would think about, first of all, what are the different endpoints uh, approaches that we see out there. First, there is, you know, the traditional way of, I got signature, I've seen this before, I'm going to block it, right? Mm -hmm. And complement that by, you know, speaking to the cloud, looking at the rest of the world and getting, you know, feedback backwards and forwards. That's not quick enough back to Paul's point about, I, I don't care about the one, it's important, of course, protect me from the known, but what about the unknown? I need a, I need a, a, a system that is able to detect that without signatures. Uh, and, you know, there has been in the industry for the past five or maybe five to ten years that notion of indicate, indicators of compromise, which is, you know, specific IP address or or DNS or, you know, a file sample or a registry key change or all those we call indication of compromise. But those individually do not matter because what attackers are doing, they're cons constantly changing those. So it's all about the behavior. If I have a trend or, you know, a number of indicators of compromise, uh, related together, I call that indicator of attack. And and through the cloud, uh, the CrowdStrike platform, we look at indicators of attacks. We enable that through our policies, so that we focus on a tunable indicator of attacks, where the the system, with the with the help of the threat hunters in the back end, are able to say that is a behavior that actually resembles an attack, and I block it. Obviously, we give the customer the choice to take the type of remediation, whether it's pocket blocking prevention, mm -hmm. et cetera, or alerting on it. But it's important that the tool that you use generically when it comes to endpoint does take that into perspective. Right, yeah. So, uh, Sharif, uh, it's very interesting that some of what you have just described uh, brings in this angle of uh, innovation, right? So there's a lot of uh, innovative ways in which your, your solutions and your offerings now are tackling uh, cybersecurity issues, and, and and a lot of it has got to do with the fact that even the attackers now are getting more sophisticated, right? And 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 as we all know, even attackers now are using AI, right? In terms of the attacks, yes. right, on, on large organizations. Uh, I think recently we just heard that uh, Singapore Technologies, you know, the US subsidiary, uh, just got hit with the uh, ransomware, right? Uh, I mean, fortunately, it's, it's contained. Uh, apparently, the, the network uh, leading to the ones, the headquarters here in Singapore is safe. Uh, but I, 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 I wouldn't rule out the fact that, you know, this there was a certain level of sophistication in even the, the way uh, it was done. Uh, and this is where I'm going to ask Emil, right? So uh, the angle about having innovation, even in coming out with cybersecurity solutions, uh, do you see that uh, happening more with the startups? You know, the engagement that you have, uh, startups who are uh, building, right, more innovative cybersecurity solutions, right? Uh, let's say here in the region, uh, what, what are your, your views and can you share more about your engagement with them? Oh, for sure. Um, for cybersecurity, you definitely have to innovate. I mean, uh... I mean, change is the only constant. Uh, whether you are an existing company for the last, you know, existing cybersecurity company for the last 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, uh, you always need to in innovate your current products uh, to keep up to current trend, uh, current attacks. Uh, and then, of course, uh, you see new startups coming up, uh, which is more, you know, smaller, they're more nimble, they're more agile, uh, doing, uh, offering quick fixes that uh, a lot of companies uh, are actually looking for. Right, uh, and 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 companies will adopt them to see how you can can gel existing solution as well as this new up and coming up and coming uh, innovation. Uh, mm -hmm. What's interesting about this page, especially at this moment uh, in this COVID nineteen situation, is uh, I'll say uh, th um, there is a there's a big three phase approach. Uh, there's this uh, uh, three phase process at the moment. Uh, companies, uh, any any companies in in the world, 
are going this could will be going through these three phases. Phase number one is uh, when COVID nineteen hits, uh, everyone has to uh, you know with circuit breaker, all these new three phases coming up. Um, phase one is how do you adopt, how do you adapt uh, to 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 continue as a business for the next uh, couple of months. Uh, right after this phase will be the more. next one that uh, they will re-strategize. <laughs> they will re-strategize again. Uh, 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 and see what what is um what is the business going to look like in the next one to two years or even five years down the road, uh and and uh looking at their current uh adaptation they will probably uh relook at the entire architecture whatever we have seen in the, the in, in architecture last year and this year looks terribly different, um I think some companies are, are very int uh, uh, uh suddenly realize they their companies actually have video conferencing capabilities the last five years they have they have never tap on it and now everyone is a video conferencing guru right um so after after september you get to see uh it teams have to re-strategize re-architect everything uh see whether what are things that they can move to the cloud uh what what even is a, a definition of endpoints um that could look drastically very different uh, the, the next uh, in 2021. And then your third phase will come in in terms of uh, investing in the future, right? Yeah. Uh, after they, they re strategize uh, the next two, three years plan, how do they continue innovating uh, to, to uh, innovate their, their, their business for the next five or 10 years? Um, so, cybersecurity, I, or, or, even if you're big or small, they are suffering the same thing. Um, yeah. because uh, whatever they have came up with uh, is was supposed to just address things that is last year 2019. Yeah. Um, now they are they are they are repackaging their product to see how they can quickly address uh, problems that that companies want to solve today. Uh, yeah. And they will go through the same phase, uh, seeing what is the new architecture is going to be like. Uh, yeah. Or even projecting what architecture will be like because no one kind of really knows no one is really setting the way um they're gonna they, they have to do that projection and and lastly um how do they fit into being called innovative uh being called uh, the, the future innovation uh in mm -hmm. 2021 2022 and, and and so on uh so it's, a, it's it's gonna be a catch up because uh architecture is is changing as we speak uh okay. security products kind of also have to make the big bets uh you know what 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 it's gonna look like and how are they gonna entice company to adopt such solutions um so you I was, uh, right, uh, Emil, yeah yeah I, I like to just uh uh take the point that you made to, about the that COVID actually has created what they call a burning platform right a burning platform for many organizations now to accelerate their digital transformation efforts. Now, on that point, maybe uh, in the interest of time, uh, let's do the poll. Uh, we have one polling question. We'll just uh, bring that up and that, uh, you know, uh, for the attendees uh, to respond to this question. So what are your most critical security challenges during this COVID-19 crisis? Uh, you're supposed to select your top two. Uh, it's either your cybersecurity policy management, network security, cloud security, your cybersecurity operations or your endpoint. Okay. Uh, once you have done that, uh, we will uh, get the results and then uh, we'll talk about it later during this discussion. So now uh, it will be uh, also a good point to get questions from the attendees. And I have a few questions on the screen and I will direct it to the panelists, right? So the first question is for Paul Lake. Uh, what are some of the legal checks on organization that organizations can consult for criminal background check on an annual basis? And if possible, how does the company go about doing this? Uh, Paul Lick, uh, you got the question? Yes, I got a question. Yeah, it's, yeah. A, it's an interesting like question. Yeah. Okay. Can you hear me? yeah, I can hear you. Go ahead, Paul. Yeah. Yeah, it's an interesting question, uh, and in fact, I may not be in the right positions to even answer this question. This is more okay. very much on the legal and HR topics, right? Uh, definitely, company will have to do. Uh, I, what I can say here is that company can have to do their due diligence in doing certain level of background checks, and that is also subjected to based on country per country or markets kind of requirement, 
right? At, at, yeah. So so I would say is that you know it is uh is is very subjective. It's just like our privacy regulations. Every country have their own privacy regulations, and we we will have the the very first thing is to have that compliance with each of those regulations in country. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, maybe uh, Paul, look, uh, you know, uh, because you're working uh, in an area where there's a lot of, uh, you know, due diligence, a lot of governance. Uh, would you like to uh, uh, say something about this? I know there's a legalistic uh, response to this, but uh, I think uh, different countries are all trying to adapt, right? And everybody, the goalpost is shifting, no doubt. But I think. Uh, policies are changing as we speak, uh, but uh, do you have any uh, points to make about this question? Well, I, I guess I'm in a privileged position because government government agencies generally have access to certain data that companies may not have access to. Right? Um, yeah, so that, it's a little bit tricky because you're, it, where do we draw the line between a, a person's pri private life? Mm -hmm. Where do we draw the line between and we we've, we have the yellow ribbon project in Singapore. It's about you know giving a person a second chance. Where do we draw that line? Are we worried that because the fellow stole? We used to call it shoplifting. Now shop theft. He stole something from a shop when he was you know in primary school. Yeah. Is that something that we hold against a person for life? Well, yeah, right. I'm not sure. Yeah. Okay. Right. So yeah, you're right. So it is a uh, it's a difficult uh, area, and uh, I think it is still work in progress for many countries. Right. Let's get on to the next question, uh, and this any of you could take it. Uh, cyber risk also resides in third-party networks that are connected with the prince with the principal organization. How can we better address third-party cyber risk? Uh, Sharif, maybe you would like to take this question. Yeah, and I'd like to, to actually I'd like to actually answer it from a real-life uh, customer scenario. A number of customers here in the region that have done this. Uh, I mean, you spend a lot of time on your own networking capabilities to, you know, increase the maturity and increase the security posture. And once you open up that gap to a third party contractor that could be weak in terms of care capabilities, you're basically as strong as your weakest link. Right. And we've seen a number of customers. What they did is they took a very um, new approach. So they before they, the network uh, is connected to any third party, Contractually, they will ensure in the contracts that the the um, the um, um, any machine that's connected to their networks has to install the agent and have the same level, if not more, in terms of policy and capability. And they scan that before it goes to the network. And only once it comes clean and acceptable in terms of the standard that you would accept into your network, do they allow it? We actually have a number of customers doing this now. So basically, they give the agent, deploy the agent, and once that, once the work of the sub of the contractor is done, whether that's week, days, months, years, they can remove that. But that gives you a capability of a very, um, a very uh, pragmatic approach to go in and check on that and make sure that it's back to your standards. The beauty, you can only do this, by the way, if you have something that can be quickly deployed, that's cloud-based, that agile, scalable. You can't do this if you have, you know, on-prem sort of traditional servers and give an agent and because everybody like look at us now, we're all remotely. So I'd expect something that's cloud-based to be able to deploy that. So answering that question, definitely that's on a tactical perspective, one of the ways. Obviously, there's the you no know, the strategically you have contractuals, liabilities, etc. But I found that um model only deployed and i worked in so many vendors before and i only found in crowdstrike that crowdstrike customers were able to deploy that for third parties and that was through a discussion with the, uh, one large customer that we have here in the region and then i found out that many are doing the same right interesting Sharif. yeah and and, and and like you said uh you have to have the right architecture right and you have to be operating on say on the cloud for instance uh to be able to uh, leverage right on uh, being a bit more agile and the the solution that you talk about agents I think uh, it's very practical and it certainly will be very useful especially now where uh, a lot of uh, logistics players especially right uh, supply chains are being disrupted right so you don't want uh, to be affected by your third party partners right and I think uh, this 
will continue to be a challenge uh, during this lockdown. And also, I think since now COVID is going to be over a long haul, uh, this particular challenge has to be addressed as we go along. But certainly, some of the solutions that you talked about are practical ones that can immediately be used, right? The next question is for Emil, all right? Uh, okay. It's, uh, it's apart from the big banks, right? Is that the one? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sorry. The one of, okay, Emil, how to get ecosystem to collaborate more? to manage cyber risk? Uh, yeah. Interesting one. Um, yeah, yeah. Right. Uh, I'll say among the, among the ecosystem of uh, cybersecurity practitioners, all of us recognize that this is a big problem. Uh, and uh, I actually, when it comes to cyber risk uh, or when it comes to third party risk and, and all, I would actually direct it to, to it's actually more of a governance, uh, cybersecurity governance problem rather than just the ecosystem, and, and very less so a uh, ecosystem problem. Uh, all in all, the whole principle is as, as simple. You can outsource your feature, uh, your function, but you cannot outsource uh, your accountability. At the end of the day, no matter what function you are outsourced to, you have connection, uh, and any partners you have connection with, um, your network, your data, everything is all, um, um, it pretty much is, is uh, joined together, right? Uh, right. It's conjunction. Um, so you just have to, you, you pretty much have to manage uh, any of these moving parts. Um, okay. That is uh, in order to, 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 to but you know, is, you can see as an extension of a company and the, the quick and dirty way for that is working for the last couple of years is always uh, judging by standards and due diligence uh, and contractual agreements. Uh, but, uh, as as this uh, as as uh, a big explosion of data and and uh, and companies uh, boundaries get more complicated, uh, I'll, I'll bring in Sharif point as well. You know, we, we we need to have more tools to be able to to manage all this risk, uh, yeah. and also go back to to the to the, the 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 main theme of today. You know, how how do we uh, uh, have uh, tools that is able to 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 help human makes better decision uh, with with all the ex explosion of data that we are facing. That's right. Yeah. So related to this, I have another question here. Maybe Paul Lake, you would like to take this question. How important is data governance in mitigating the human risk factor? Sorry, can so, you repeat the question again? How important is data governance in mitigating the human risk factor? I think uh, maybe it's yeah. better that you could relate it to some of the work that you're doing uh, at MSD because you know, uh, data governance, I'm quite sure, and consistency across the different markets uh, that yep. you're operating in must be a very important part of your work. Yeah, yep, definitely. Data, data governance is definitely very much important. And, and to the point of uh, today's topic, right, uh, mitigating some of this risk, especially that relates to out from human, is really back to the, the real basic, right? Ultimately, you still need a human. Right, you still need a human. So, so, and and this has to comes with a baseline in terms of security awareness uh, for everyone in the organization, and it has to come from a top-down approach. You know, it cannot be just bottom up. It has to be a top-down that as a baseline that everyone needs to have a certain types of awareness, knowledge about the processes and stuff like that. Right, but of top, of course, right. Uh, the company has the liberty at the same time to make it more creative and innovation, right? To make right. things fun for people to learn. Because one of those psychological uh, uh, thought is that you gamify certain things, but people enjoy it, right? Uh, they will remember it, right? And especially when you have certain scenario on that. So that can be correlate back into having a strong uh, awareness program. And of yep. course, then you profile to the rest of the user or employees in the company. Whereby this set of user is it whether it is uh, use set, assessing sensitive data, right? Mm -hmm. Then there will be a, another set, right, of of uh, of uh, tools that enable the users to navigate through, right? Okay. So I, I'll say I'll, I'll conclude that by saying that you know human is still one of the most important element, and 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 because they they are our talent. And that it is really paramount that we, we cannot eliminate the human element in this whole entire data governance uh, and, and, and risk management side. 
Thanks, thanks, Paul, for uh, sharing your, your, your views. Uh, and, uh, you know, the questions are coming in fast and furious. It's very encouraging. But uh, in the interest of time, I'll just take one more question and I'll probably ask uh, Sharif, uh, this question could be very much related to the work that you're doing currently now during this crisis. So the question is, many people now are working from home and uh, during COVID-19. So uh, is there any impact on the cybersecurity in terms of policies and solutions, especially with the clients that you're dealing with now on a regular basis? Yeah, definitely. So first of all, the journey that we went with in the clients in the past three months has not been in any shape different in terms of the deployment methodology that we had with what before COVID, meaning that all we needed to do, customers came overnight, they had to roll out tools that are able to monitor the individuals that are using their personal uh, laptops or personal home workstations or tablets, right? So we had mm -hmm. the same agent and the same policy. So all the customers, existing customers had to do is just create new packages and roll it out to the, to the external uh, users and, you know, whether they're using their own uh, um, machines workstations or using the company it was the same uh, but the journey for the new customers is what was interesting for us so to see a new customer that is used to a an on-prem or a hybrid deployment suddenly with his whole team asked and, and actually if you remember Rama through a previous panel yeah. that we had here we had the number of uh, uh, panelists as well and and one of them was from from philippines from a bank there and they talked about overnight how they had to shift their whole model their vpn went from a you know inside out to outside in and so with the bandwidth issues the um the capabilities that they had the, the the new it hygiene landscape that they used to because in your it land hygiene uh baseline when you're in a company that you know all your assets your it hygiene is up here and you know you know which at least you know a, a very good fair amount of which applications operating systems vulnerabilities that you have so you can assign resources to the highest right what happened in this is that suddenly customers are working on you know um their own tablets their own home users and we're asking them to deploy um new applications that haven't been tested or rolled out have not gone through a change control uh, you know, all those tons of video applications that people come overnight with collaboration tools, sharing tools, everything is remote, remotely managed through, through SaaS. So for the individuals that are working from home, for the IT organizations to monitor that, IT hygiene was a big thing that we had to, to a lot of the customers looked at not only the EDR um, and next generation AV prevention capabilities, they started looking at, I want to discover all the you know, the highest vulnerabilities that I have on my most vulnerable assets. And for those C executive level that are set of home, I want their machines to be clean 100%, right? So I link in IT hygiene and all, for us it was easy because the same agent, same data set that we collect, all we needed to do is just switch on new modules from the cloud. So that's why I believe that the model of architecture of being able to collect once, you know, no active scanning, cloud-based, does work very well in times of COVID and moving on because COVID is not going to end. Back to Paul's uh, point here that there's going to be a lot of actually Emil's points about what we learn now and the speed and the tactical approach. And then everybody will, you know, take a step back, modify their policies, modify their, uh, you know, their incident response plan and business continuity plan and disaster recovery is going to be very different. And then have policies that are targeted for users uh, specifically when they bring their own device and all this. So it's a complete shift from people processing technology and, and being part of this while we were here at CrowdStrike and seeing how easy it was for customers. I, I keep bringing that, that example, but one customer, one of the biggest financials in Asia, two days to roll out 10 plus thousand nodes is something big, regardless of what vendor or what technology you're working in. I haven't seen that speed of rollout and it was simple. And that to me is a plus because they were able to get baseline protection in day three so that's important so okay. thanks thanks Sharif uh, it was very good for you to bring up that reference case as well and I think it makes a lot of sense especially uh, with these days where agility right is important uh, and like you said you have to be comprehensive to a certain extent in terms of knowing what can happen and to be prepared for it 
So maybe at this point, it may be good now to quickly pull out the uh, results for the poll, right? And just to see what were some of the responses. So can uh, Jessica, can we have the uh, results? There you are. Okay, so let me pull this window down. Yeah. So uh, number one was all about uh, cybersecurity policy. Uh, sorry, oh, right at the end, endpoint, right? Endpoint detection was 56%. Uh, actually, this uh, uh, corresponds very well with what the panelists, uh, like for instance, I think Sheriff, you were just talking about it just now in terms of what your clients were, were undergoing. So this came up tops. Then we have 48% uh, was on network security. Yeah, VPNs, firewalls. I think uh, network and connectivity was uh, a big challenge for many organizations because suddenly, you know, so many of the employees were working from home. So it's understandable that this also came out as the top two. And then 40% was on uh, policy, right? And we talked about this as well, where, you know, uh, policies uh, need to be constantly reviewed uh, to adapt to what's happening during this crisis. Okay. That's very good. Uh, I think that was this. This is, is an excellent way now uh, to end the one hour. So I like to thank uh, all my panelists, uh, Paulik, Emil, Paulo, and of course Sheriff. Thank you very much uh, to all my panelists. I think it was absolutely a very interesting discussion, very thought pro provoking as well. I don't think we have answers to everything, but like they have always said. Uh, the first way to solve a problem is to bring it up and to share, you know, what your peers or what your clients are undergoing. And I think this will lead to better solutions as we move along. So uh, before we end this session, uh, we also need to get the participants. Thank you very much for staying on and tuning in to this live webinar. Uh, without you, uh, this will not be possible. So I'd like to thank all of you. And I do hope that you found the uh, webinar fruitful as well. Right? And uh, of course, thank you very much to CrowdStrike right, for making this whole webinar possible. And uh, I do believe that you know, even after this session, you will continue to engage the participants uh, on a neat basis. Right? And uh, very much, yes, uh, your evaluation form uh, will be distributed to all of you. So please uh, find the time to provide your feedback so that we can continue to improve on this uh, live webinars that we're going to have ahead of us. Okay, right. So on that note, thank you very much, everybody. Stay safe. Bye. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.